my, my title is really, you know, it's pretty big picture and pretty important, of course. Um, and I've put climate and biodiversity as the two sort of uh, subtexts uh, that you know, I, I want to get across uh, as being particularly important in, in this. Um, and we heard this morning from the Dean, and uh, I did enjoy the Dean's talk because it, it provided a bit of a platform for me as well, um, you know, to, to, to start. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk a lot about climate because I'm not comfortable in that uh, field. Um, and, uh, but I know about biodiversity, so I feel happy about, about that, and I know a little bit about veterinary science, disease, and so forth. Um, so I wanted to start to sort of clear the climate side of this in a way which hopefully will be convincing. We all have our opinions on climate, you know, from no problem to an incredibly big problem, um, and it, that works across society, politicians, you name it. MIT developed uh, uh, a model recently. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, quite a complicated model, actually, based on a lot of data. In other words, it is a lot of data that's been gathered of our climate. But what was good about this model, has anybody seen this model, this En-ROADS model? I can't see any hands up. That's good. OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, they developed this model really to help this issue of a complexity science to sort of uh, help people to, to, to recognize the direction we have to go and why it's important we go in that direction. Okay, we heard that uh, one solution is to increase the number of chickens. It's, it's a very interesting uh, aspect, which I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, in, in the detail of my talk. Uh, but it's up to you in the end to make your decisions. But okay, so what I'm going to do, and this, ah, we've got this nice big clicker. That's what I needed. My eyesight is also, there was a tiny clicker and I couldn't, uh, you know, the pointer. So I couldn't see it. Now I can see it. Thank you very much, <laughs> the technology. All right, so the thing about this, this is, you all know about this, uh, we must keep temperature rise below 1.5. Okay, we all know that. All right. The fact we're, we're over that already is a bit of a problem, um, but unfortunately, we're, we're currently heading to 3.54. Uh, I don't think people really appreciate what that means. It, it is an extraordinary problem because at that level, we put ourselves back pre-Pleistocene. Okay? We put ourselves back to when half the planet had an ice cap on it. Uh, we put ourselves back into situations where it would be very difficult for humanity and very much of life to survive. Okay, so uh, this is not a joke, and I think, I think everybody understands that. But we're, we're heading in a bad direction, so what can we do? This is the point. Now, I'm in South Africa, so what this model does is that you say, okay, if we, if we modify the use of things, for example, if we, if we have the status quo currently of coal use in the planet, so if you look at the situation. You'll see the important thing to look at is the temperature, all right? What happens to the temperature if we now reduce coal use, okay? Now, just, just watch what happens. Not a lot, okay? So I can't cheer you up, all right? <laughs> okay, so coal's not going to do, do much for us. Uh, let's look at renewables. Okay, this is what we're all going ahead to. Okay, can't do, doesn't do very much. All right. Okay, we won't give you too many of these things. Now we talked about animals, right? And methane and animals. Okay, this is oh a little bit better. All right. So animals are more important than coal. <laughs> Think about it. Okay. Um, all right, of course, taking them one by one is not a good idea, because we know we're not going to solve this with one, problem, with one solution, right? And that's going to be the issue. So I'm going to go straight to where, if we change the carbon price, okay? Now this is a really simple thing to do for humanity. All it requires is a bit of agreement at an international level and from society, this, this is what we need to do, okay? Very simple. And if we also address 
problems from animals. Okay, we get down to two. Now we're getting down closer to, to 1.5, right? If we throw renewables in, if we improve efficiency a bit, if we electrify more, let's go for a bit more efficiency, okay? <laughs> and, and even more efficiency, okay? We, you know, it, it just, we, we're getting there, right? And, and uh, you know, people talk a lot about forests, and I'm a biodiversity person, right? So if we do a massive amount of tree planting, it doesn't do a lot. So, that's enough, okay? If we can move on to the main uh, talk. Now, I think, I think I've got the message across, yeah? So, and this is a very good uh, science basis for thinking around that. Right, let's, let's crack on. Okay, so I always bring One Health into it only because it's a platform for us to communicate across disciplines. Happily, you, our colleagues uh, mostly, although I'm not a crop scientist, uh, I'm not even a production scientist. I'm going to talk about your subject, but I've sort of learned to, to do this in a way where I can take all the flack, um, um, but I just want to get some sort of principles and points across. So One Health is a great way to do this. Food systems, what is the problem? Food and nutrition security, and then we think about existential issues, like the climate change issue, okay, and how we've really got to address this. And of course, biodiversity in agriculture, because that's my personal passion. My, my emotion, really. And what is the future of food? Where, where are we going? Uh, and the various, we have historical precedents on ways of doing things uh, in livestock, in, in, agri, you know, in crop agriculture, etc. So we have a history that we can sort of select from and decide how to move forward. We don't have to move in any direction, in any country, actually. We can decide for ourselves. Um, you know, we don't have to listen to what the FAO tells us or the President of the United States, we can do our own thing. Okay, we, I think we all know what One Health is, um, <clears throat> but you know, it's important that it's seen as in the context of a benefit, not just to people, okay? I'm afraid a lot of people get, think it's just about what can animals do for people, what can the environment do for people to improve the health of people. Um, and I constantly fight that, and I say, no, it's what can people do for the environment, what can people do for animals? And what can people do to help themselves through doing that? That's my perspective. Okay, so it's food we're talking about. So we always food and hunger go together. That's where the emotion of food is. And uh, this is actually from 2010, okay? So it's an FAO database uh, set of data. We had 950 million people hungry, had a, had a billion undernourished, okay? And a billion overnourished. Um, so that was a sort of emerging situation in 2010. Um, now, it's the same map, so don't look at the map particularly, I just threw that in. But IFPRI did a global report in 2015. That's only five years afterwards, okay? And here we have 794 million people suffering hunger, 2 billion undernourished, uh, nearly 2 billion overnourished. Now, I'm not sure I believe it changed so quickly, okay? But of course, data is, this is what data is. And if data is managed by different groups, even if they might be international, um, you have to ask the question, well, you know, is that a real change? Or is this something to do with the way the data was managed? But it still gets the same point across that we, we still have a lot of problems. So, um, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres just recently, in July, okay, a couple of months ago, uh, says global food systems are broken. Now, that's not me talking as a, you know, a, a, a fairly ignorant scientist you know, who knows a little bit about his own field. This is a chap who's been given that responsibility to tell the world uh, what the uh, analysts are telling him, that we have a problem, okay? So I think, I sort of accept that. Uh, I think global food systems are broken. I've actually thought this for quite a long time. And uh, I've, I got involved with uh, colleagues, uh, for example, in Minnesota, and, and started engaging as a veterinarian, as a wildlife um, health specialist, as an infectious disease person, with others, to look at the issue of food, because I felt strongly that this was one of those areas that if we resolve it, we will actually help very much all those different people, animals, environment. Okay, so it's so fundamental. Uh, so that motivated me to work with these people. So I have, have a little bit of that uh, uh, 
strength to my arguments that, that I've at least engaged uh, and not just on the internet. Okay, so <coughs> we, we have, what's interesting here is that he now has 780 million people. So in 2023, uh, who are hungry, that's actually down. That's actually down from the last one. Um, um, but he then says nearly one third of all food producers lost or wasted. I've known that for quite a while. I think we all have really. Um, and then more than three billion cannot afford healthy diets. So that's interesting. Um, what he did say, and I think this is where the politics often comes into these things. Um, yeah, so he didn't really emphasize that uh, agriculture for all its sins uh, is reducing the number of hungry people. Okay, so that's a good thing. You know, if it's reduced by 10 million, that's 10 million people who used to be hungry are not hungry now. Um, but we know inequity persists, okay, and that uh, it's, a, it's a distribution problem, actually, that, that those 790 uh, million people still can't get food. Uh, now, the, but to me, the big question is, the reason for 3 billion on unhealthy diets is that the food system is geared in the wrong way, okay? Um, and we are talking about few globalized food commodities. We have abundant cheap food. Uh, with massive profits. So I, I feel we have a problem in the way food is being produced because of the, in a sense, the economic systems that we have. Um, and the only way we're getting di any sort of diversity in food is through processing. So you can buy the same product in a hundred different ways and forms and structures um, and flavors and so on. So you think you're getting a varied diet, but actually it's based on few commodities. All right. Now, meat. That's another really big topic amongst young people. Three children, two vegetarians, one. Yeah. And, and what am I? <laughs> well, I have, you know, I have Afrikaans roots, so I like meat. And uh, you know, I don't apologize for that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, things are changing. So, uh, you know, you have to adapt. I, I eat a lot less meat than I used to, actually. Um, but look at Africa. Uh, often people think Africa is a big meat eater. It's not. And, and that's a problem for Africa. So to support the Dean, we need more meat in Africa. We do, actually. And so you are the center for development, in a sense, of uh, the, the meat part of the diet that humans have. And so you have a very pivotal role, I believe, in progressing you know, uh, improvement in protein um, uh, intake within the continent. Okay. Now, I, I love a little bit of history when you think about these things. So animal and human evolution is in parallel, okay? So animals and us, we're, we're, we're like this. We're like this, particularly these ruminants, actually, because they are what we ate in order to evolve, okay? So they're like that with us. Um, and in fact, we've had a very stable climate for that period. That's the other thing we forget, okay? Incredibly stable climate, which has enabled us to evolve in certain ways and, um, um, and expand and so forth. So we're going into an unstable climate now. And so the whole thing is going to change. Our relationships and, and all sorts of things that we, you know, we don't really n understand and know yet. What I find also interesting as a biodiversity scientist is that the Holocene, this is the period I'm talking about, overhunting was a big problem. So we talk about the Holocene extinctions. Okay, a lot of animals went extinct because humans were relying on animals directly, uh, not on crops or, agri you know, or plants and, and vegetables to, to much extent. And what happened is they were running out of animals. So the early evolved peoples were struggling to get out there and run after these animals because there were fewer and fewer of them. And so they began to get, and paleopathology shows this at the time, that they began to get problems, actually, uh, with their, um, you can see it in their bones. And so uh, there was a, a sort of shift to riverine systems where there were shellfish and so some accessible food that they could get. That settlement, that sedentarization led to the access and use of grains and so on locally where they were settled, which was the beginning of agriculture. So agriculture was really a, a, almost a, an accident, an accident of, of overhunting, all right? And, and of course, it then led humanity in a, 
in a completely different direction. And we, we, you know, we still have remnants of the hunting communities, um, and of course the pastoral communities are also part of that. Uh, but the majority of people are agriculturalists, and that's how society uh, developed. Um, and you know the crops, and we can see how much of the world is dedicated to crops. Uh, it's a huge, huge proportion of the world is dedicated. Um, I'm not a crop scientist, so you won't get many slides about crops. <laughs> Natural animal resources were depleted, you know, even beyond the Holocene. And of course, in recent times, it's been very, very dramatic. Um, uh, and of course, we're trying to protect it by force. And uh, I don't need to actually speak too much about biodiversity and its importance in the subject in South Africa. I would, uh, you understand that because wildlife is so important to your economy uh, and your future. Um, Arid areas have always been associated with animal-based food systems. Why? Because you can't grow crops there easily. Um, and animals survive very well in these conditions. Um, so it it's really was the only choice for many of these people. Um, and of course, domestication, if you look at the process of domestication, uh, it, it was often in those societies where they were in dry conditions, Mesopotamia, for example, um, and uh, it was the logical way to go. And so, you know, it's not surprising we have that. And some are entirely dependent. This is a picture from my brother, Michael. I always compliment his photography, it's fantastic. Um, this is from Sudan, um, where I've worked also, and it's, you know, it is remarkable to see this level of relationship between animals and people. Uh, but, you know, the, the great thing about Af Africans generally is that this is deep in their culture and they take it with them when they go into the town. So the urban systems often, in the initial phases of urbanization, they bring the animals with, you know, in such a way that it's chaos. And I mean, this is, I think, really expresses it really well. Um, but it, you know, it obviously it changes and shifts um, uh, over time, but it's, it's really, really interesting. We don't let go of what we know helps us, um, and that's a cultural thing. Yeah, so the world wars, starvation, and so on, um, you know, that's where the food, that's where the FAO came from, okay? Food security. We've got to stop the starvation. It's so cruel, so, so hard. Uh, and so this idea of food security became so dominant in the 19, late 40s, 50s, and it drove all of the production science. It, produ it produced enormous changes in the way we uh, do agriculture, and it brought enormous productivity benefits. We all know this, okay? Great success in agricultural science. Many of, of the older members in here are probably major contributors to that over the years. And we should really, you know, say, well done. You did a fantastic job. But as, as this whole thing has pro progressed and demand increased, we had to produce more and more food, more and more food. So this led to consolidation, segregation, industrialization. And animals have become biological food machines, actually. Um, and somehow the spirit of the animal uh, and the person, there's been a break in that. We no longer respect the spirit of the animal, and uh, it, you know we we put it away, and uh, and we we turn it into profit, which drives the economy and is important. But there's something lost uh, in this process. We hide the animals away. Not so much in Africa, I'm happy to say, but you go to Europe, where are the most animals, often in cities, you will find tens of millions of animals, like pigs or poultry and so on, in the middle of cities in Controlled environments, buildings you don't, with no windows, you see nothing. People don't go there. But they still discharge waste, but they stop pathogens coming in because they found in places like Europe that disease control, it's, you couldn't produce these um, machines, these food machines, because their immunological capacities just collapsed. They couldn't live in a normal world, so you put them, put them away and you make sure that the pathogens are kept out. And that's been a sort of principle, which you know, I'm, I'm obviously as a vet and you are, I'm very well of. The other thing we need to think about, and I'm pointing very much at the Dean on this, but about farming systems, numbers and densities. So there were over two, 21 billion food animals um, uh, you know, for, for six billion people, um, and there were predictions made. So I'm, you know, this is in my time frame. So I remember being at meetings when they were talking about these things, and they predicted. So all these top analysts predicted this is what's going to happen, um, and they came up, uh, you know, that there'd be, you know, be over 30 billion required. 
And, and they got the paltry really wrong by a factor. I don't know, it was something I think they thought maybe 20 billion chickens or 10 billion chickens. Anyway, we have 50 billion chickens now. Okay? So it is an extraordinary phenomenon, probably because of the conversion ratios you know, on, on, on energy. You know, it's just driven that and it's profitable and, and so on. But it has consequences. Okay? And one of the consequences that I see of the poultry explosion in the 1990s is avian influenza, a highly pathogenic avian influenza. H5N1 is directly linked to those, you know, growth in poultry in Southeast Asia, invested out of Hong Kong in particular, but also Frankfurt, New York, etc. Massive investment in the poultry system because we needed the protein and we knew people liked it and, and, and it was going to be profitable, there's no question. Okay, so it's an animal that you can hide away in a controlled environment, no problem. Um, but it has consequences. We blame wild birds. <laughs> but wild birds don't really, ca they're not really a reservoir for highly pathogenic avian influenza. They're a reservoir for low pathogenic avian influenza and the evolution of the virus. Uh, sadly, because we've uh, developed these very pathogenic forms within the poultry environment, uh, this is now impacting the wildlife. So they now are beginning to carry this, these pathogenic viruses, which not only affects poultry, but as you know from the last six months, wipes out large numbers and colonies of, uh, of, of wild birds. That's a serious problem. So is modern agriculture simply unsustainable? Do we have a choice? Reflect on that. We're in difficult times. So let's think about industrial agriculture and the benefits and the costs of industrial. Um, it, it's feeding people, okay? So this is very, so that's, we park that to one side. And the three billion people, and I think most of you are included, are really healthy as a result, okay? We're lucky, okay? We're the lucky ones. Um, there's still four billion people who are not doing well. Okay, that's, that's a serious problem. Um, of course, what it does, industrial agriculture, economies of scale. But what does it depend on? It depends on fossil fuel, fertilizers, um, and, the, and the CC cost is too high. I've shown you that. All right? There are only two things we can do. Carbon price and methane are the two things that will make a big difference to climate change. All right? So we have to think on this. Um, I mean, we, we know that by putting them in these controlled situations, keep the, you know, keep the pathogens out, we can reduce the frequency and opportunity for encounter of infection, and we get fewer occupationally. In other words, a person in a pastoral system, he, he gets challenged by brucellosis or ticks, okay, ambulomas, whatever. He gets into cephalitis. Um, and this is part of living with animals, actually. That's the challenge of living with animals. So we can, we can reduce that by putting animals away, separating ourselves. Um, but think of the costs of maintaining that high biosecurity. Um, and think of the cost of pathogen evolution in that context, going back to the H5N1. Does COVID-19 come from the food system, actually? Does it come from these Chinese farms with uh, palm civets? I suspect that's where it originated from or even the lab, okay? So these are the things we have to now calculate in when we come to uh, how we manage our animals. It's efficient and profitable, of course it is. Um, but, but even with that efficiency, look at the waste. Massive, massive, it's the scale of waste is increased by the industrialization. Okay, so these are important points to reflect on. The agro-environment benefits and costs. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the good things about better methods of growing crops, for example, is it can reduce overall land use. And that's often argued. But overall, if you take it all into account, intensification has catastrophic environmental costs. Just think, 23% of GHG emissions uh, from land use change, okay, for agriculture. Uh, we have 38% of the land, 95% of the water on this planet goes into agriculture, okay. That has big consequences for biodiversity in particular. Um, and I'm afraid biodiversity loss mainly from animal agriculture. And, and pollution is a big issue that's associated with the system. 
So biosecurity is a strong argument, okay? So <clears throat> I, I appreciate that, um, but it's costly. It's very costly. Uh, employs vets, keeps us in business, uh, happy to say. Um, of course, there's you know, the sort of costs of mechanization, um, the, the processing of food, um, the high dependency on drugs, uh, but all is good for the economy, ironically, okay? Uh, without a problem, you don't have an economy. Um, <clears throat> So there are many things that we can argue, and I won't dwell too much on that. And there's this thing about breeding bigger is better, okay? So we get, if you go to a, a field in, in the Netherlands now, you will see these monsters. You know, we used to have big hyenas in Africa and big rhinoceros, three, four times the size. You go to, you go to Holland now, and you look at this cow, and you can't believe it. I mean, it is so big, and it's producing, you know, nearly 100 liters of milk. Okay. You come to an old scrawny African cow, you get 14 liters, you know. But, but this, is the, this is the thing, okay? But of course, we're doing lots of things genetically to these animals. This homogeneity, um, we, 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 we change their microbiomes, we have permissive viruses as a product. So there are many things we do when, when you know, and yeah, we're clever, smart, but there is a consequence. And of course, we end up with feedlots. Um, you know, 10,000, 20,000 animals in one place. Uh, not that the, I mean, if I look at a wildebeest migration, it looks like this, okay? So it's not that it's inherently wrong, okay, to have animals under these conditions, uh, but at least the wildebeest has a chance to, you know, go to Kenya or back to Tanzania. <laughs> these guys don't. Um, and of course, with modern food systems, many diseases have been associated with that. And I, I, I just throw this up, I'm not going to dwell on it at all. And we have science showing us how production and virulence can be linked, okay? And if you increase the harvest rate, you can actually see an increase in the virulence often of these things. So, um, so pathogens adapt to the system, and they actually benefit from this productivity that we generate and the homogeneity of the populations, and their virulence then can, can also increase because it makes them more efficient at, um, at occupying that space and benefiting from that, uh, that biology. Um, and we, we see a very much infection sectorially associated. So, you know, we can sort of show how particular systems tend to encapsulate certain kinds of, you know, pathogen development. Uh, we can see cladogenesis by sector. Um, so you can see waves, you know, associated with production increases or, or system increases, which, which uh, leads to the evolution of new viruses, okay, and new, and new pathogens generally. And if we look at human uh, uh, viruses and how they emerge, we see how the reassortment of viruses across the agricultural sector uh, then drives the emergence of, for example, the, the, the pandemic human influenzas. And you can, you can do this and you can look at where it came from, which industry it came from. So we have these industries producing these new viruses, which when they mix through trade, through movement, then generates a new virus. The H1N1 was the last human pandemic that emerged in the middle of Mexico, and those, it, the actual virus origins came from four continents, all right, through the food system, essentially. Okay, so these are important points. Uh, zoonosis, big deal with COVID. Everybody talks about zoonosis, zoonotic problems. Uh, and of course, you know, there are some important uh, zoonoses. Now, I'll just quickly go to morbidity viruses because, you know, that was something that occupied a lot of my life. Uh, I didn't particularly choose it, but it sort of chose me. And uh, I ended up working, you know, with rinderpest, distemper, pestipity ruminant virus with wildlife, you know, uh, very much across Africa and Asia. And, uh, you know, it's a, they're amazing viruses. And, and, you know, they affect very wide, from the marine system to the terrestrial system. They're really interesting viruses. Um, and, look, I don't want you to, you can't read this. It's, um, we've got a new, this new book out called Wildlife, Health and Disease and Conservation, and I've got a chapter in there, and I bring this out. But if you look at the, I mean, it's, there's a degree of speculation in this, you know, that's what molecular genetics is all about. But I think it serves its purpose, um, that we see the evolution, the rinderpest virus, which, because it was associated with the domestication of animals, uh, it brought the virus in close contact to humans. Humans then got measles, and so we have the evolution of the measles problem. Um, from the measles problem, uh, this virus was taken across to South America. It then appears to have um, got into the carnival population, candid population in particular, which then led to distemper. Distemper was then brought back on the ships to uh, Europe, and we saw distemper spreading across uh, the globe. 
I experienced the wave of distemper finally emerging within East Africa in lions in, you know, in the last uh, two, three decades. Uh, very dramatic, gets on the news, et cetera, et cetera. It's calmed down nicely now. But, um, and then we, we have also seen uh, the movement of these viruses and their evolution into the marine environment. So the most contemporary mobility viruses are now in whales, uh, cetaceans, and the origins are probably through waste coming through estuarine systems from animal, uh, from you know, terrestrial animals. Um, so we, we need to, in our heads, we need to give ourselves a, a sense of history and the sense of what makes things change and evolve in the context of these sorts of diseases, because they kill a lot of people. You know, um, measles is still a big problem. There's an outbreak at the moment in Ethiopia, in, you know, and it's killing young children and, and uh, causing deafness. I mean, doing bad things, okay? We've got rid of Rinderpest, well done vets, uh, but the humans are struggling to deal with one, actually. <laughs> Shows that we're much better than human beings. <laughs> but anyway. Now, there are lots of ecosystem disservices, and there's far too much information on the slide, but it's available for students in particular to look at, and they can go through it in detail. But there are many negative externalities of industrial livestock. And, you know, I don't want to, um, you know, dwell too much, but perhaps one of the biggest ones in, in contemporary public health is the processing the processing of food has led to very many you know, big problems um, in our metabolism and in our physiology and in our health. Okay? And that three billion uh, or four billion people who are suffering malnutrition and disease, it's associated with this. Okay? It's that system of, of uh, processing our food products. Um, yeah, good. And antimicrobial resistance as an example of a modern problem that's associated with the paradigm of disease control. Of course we were going to use antimicrobials, they were present already, it was purely an accident that somebody did, you know, contaminated I think one of the in vitro studies and found, my goodness, that, that fungus does, does, does something remarkable. It sort of reminds me of the, of the uh, plants, oh my goodness, this plant does that, you know. I mean, most of what we've discovered is actually out there. It's just we, we sort of, um, you know, trip over it and then say, oh, good. And then we get a Nobel Prize for that, which is brilliant. But, <laughs> but it's, anyway, the point is, um, you know, AMR is, you know, I mean, the use of antibiotics, massive use of antibiotics in humans and obviously domestic animals is behind this uh, very threatening uh, problem, which is, it has a high prominence in one health. Quick, a quick aside on zoonosis and zoonotic diseases, because uh, the last time I came here <clears throat> was right at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, all right? And all the people out there were, were all saying, ah, what's this nonsense? You know, what's, is this really a problem? Um, I happened to be giving a talk on emerging diseases, so it was sort of coincident, you know, I didn't plan it, you invited me. But <clears throat> anyway, it was, it was sort of interesting that everybody was pretty complacent, actually. They were all thinking, no, this is not a big deal. Um, and uh, I got the last flight out of Johannesburg, uh, very last flight. Uh, thank goodness. And it was uh, like the world was coming to an end. I mean, it was really, I mean, the, the fighting to try and get on that plane at the airport was quite unnerving and even worse in Addis Ababa because it had to stop on the way. Uh, and there was violence. They had to bring the army in to stop people. So, you know, our, the balance between the world being in a good place where we're all relaxed and in a bad place is quite, quite narrow. Um, and uh, complacency is a very dangerous thing. But agendas come out of all these things. So one of the big agendas that came out of the COVID uh, epidemic is wildlife origin, right? It's wildlife's fault. Oh, okay, uh, that's fine, we can blame them, they, they don't vote. Um, and, and this is the problem, okay? So there was a lot of talk, zoonosis, zoonotic risk, you know, R naught, all these words and terms were bandied around in media, internationally and so on, but actually even scientists and people who are not familiar with zoonosis and zoonotic diseases and their emergence and evolution were confusing and conflating things, okay? So this idea, and the, there was one publication in particular, Kate Jones, who I work with and share PhDs with, um, she published a paper in 2008, which if you look at the literature, cited over and over and over again, all she did was she took the um, uh, Journal of Emerging Infectious Diseases um, uh, over 40 to 50 years, did a systematic review, broke it down and said, oh, it's interesting. Um, many human emergent pathogens have come from nature. 
where else would they come from? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't, when I, you know, and, and I think she thought that as well, but it was good to record it and say that, you know, but the process is complex, like the Morbilli virus one, okay? It takes thousands of years sometimes. Occasionally, it's very rapid. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's important that we think about it. And we talk about zoonotic origin diseases, okay? And there was a famous uh, uh, figure, 70%, okay, of these uh, uh, emerging human pathogens come from wildlife. Um, well, it's actually wrong because uh, what, what they, it's only zoonotic origins, because emerging diseases come from other sources too, but that was never said. So you see, you lose in, in the media, in po politics and so on, all that sort of stuff drops away. If you actually calculate from Kate's paper, it's about 43% of the emerging human pathogens that she describes actually come from nature, but nearly 30% come from domestic animals. Now you have how many mammal species, how many bird species? Tens of thousands, okay? And they only contribute 40%. 14 domestic animal species contribute 30%. So it gives you this idea of proportionality. We need to, you know, we need to be you know, very careful how we, use, how we use these things. And when you look at zoonosis, now zoonosis by the WHO definition is when you get infected by an animal, so the disease comes from the animal. You get the infection from rabies. A dog bites you, you get it. Zoonotic origin pathogens, emergent pathogens. Is COVID a zoonosis? Where do you get COVID from? Humans. But it's described as a zoonosis. Because maybe <laughs> it came from animals. <laughs> so this is a big problem, all right? So we conflate these issues uh, very seriously. And if you look at the actual origins of zoonosis, it comes from domestic animals and peri-domestic wildlife, so it, ratus domesticus, basically. So it comes from your peri-domestic or domestic uh, relationship with animals. It makes sense, There's, you know, but it, unfortunately, <clears throat> now everybody thinks that wildlife's the source of all our problems. I did a major situation analysis to, for the IUCN on this, which was contradictory to several other <coughs> reports that were coming out at the time because there was so much pressure you know, to get things out there. And so many agendas, actually, even from the wildlife uh, health community, because this was a great way to get money, okay? And we all know how important that is. Okay, so going back now to some of these big picture ideas, the political economy uh, of pathogen emergence and changes in policy, um, you know, I have to watch the time, always, um, can, in effect, desterilize a natural or human ecosystem. So, we influence what happens. We influence disease. In, in a way, disease is a product of human decision-making uh, and policy. Um, and under natural systems, and those of us who work with wildlife populations, we understand. Is tilaria a real problem in wildlife? No. Is tuberculosis a real problem? Mm, in Kruger, yes. But, but in most wildlife populations, no, um, etc. So the adap adap adaptation of wildlife in its natural ecological context to path pathogens and, and microorganisms is in a balanced way, okay? So we do see <coughs> death and disease, uh, but in a, in a well-balanced population, take a seal population, um, the more heavily parasitized animals are removed from the population, but that actually creates genetic fitness in the, in the population. So they go from generation to generation, uh, maintaining a degree of resilience and fitness and, and, and aren't susceptible to many of these problems. Okay, um, so, so my point in a sense is that we need m new models of food production to balance uh, both um, security of, of health, for example, and environment, uh, nutrition, etc., and, and, and address the negative externalities of modern food systems. So we need to do that. Um, so what about biodiversity? Uh, so again, I'm not gonna talk a lot about it because I know you have a very good knowledge of this. Um, when we look at our footprint over the last, you know, very short period of time, really, uh, 50 years or so, we've gone from uh, a, a, an abundant uh, green capacity, if you like, to utilize, uh, which has really fueled our economies and so on, to a deficit, okay? It's really happened in, in a very short period of time. So we've gone from green to brown. We are over-utilizing our resources. They're not being renewed. Uh, we're emptying, uh, emptying the cupboard, okay? And this is essentially, we're over-consuming beyond our biocapacities. Um, and I don't worry about poachers, I really don't. I know it's a big thing with rhino here, and I, 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 I understand, so don't get confused. 
I, I think it's important to stop people poaching rhino. But that's not the reason for biodiversity collapse. Okay? The reason for biodiversity collapse is domestication of animals and, and industrialization of agriculture. That's the primary cause. Yes, roads have had a contribution, cities have had a contribution, and so on. But, but the biggest one is actually um, agriculture. So, you know, uh, this is sort of based on, on Orr's paper recently, where we, we have 96% of mammal biomass is now domestic animals, 4% is wild, of which 2% is marine, okay? So we have virtually, through our greed, I guess, for, well, our need for food, let's not say greed, let's say need for food, we essentially have destroyed most other mammal populations on this planet. Um, there are more chickens now, back to the Dean, more chickens than wild birds on the planet. Think on that. I'm a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a bird fanatic. I don't like that. I've seen a chicken, and I can recognize a chicken, but uh, I love to see diversity <laughs> out there. So what's the future of food? Okay, so I'm getting into the, you know, into the solution side of things now, which is, which is uh, key. Um, I'm afraid reducing animal product consumption is important, but you see I put a qualifier on it, in high-income countries. You've seen how much we consume in high-income countries. It's extraordinary. And I'm afraid South Africa is partly part of that community. You do. Um, and we need to increase it in low-income countries. Okay, so we need to get the balance. We need to get much better balance. So, um, so I don't think we're going to lose our jobs, actually. And I think we have a big role now to try and push that. Um, I personally think we need to look at regenerated natural resources for food. Fishing in the sea is the very best way and the most efficient and most sustainable way of getting protein. But if you overfish, of course, and this is what humans do, go back to the Holocene, we're not good at it, but we, you know, we've got to develop better governance structures, better management of these things. Um, and we need to increase diversity in our food system, going back to this issue of why are we sick in Europe uh, from our food, particularly in Northern Europe because we don't have diversity anymore. We, and we eat lots of processed and bad food. And we end up, I, I mean, 40% of our children are obese, or clinically, not clinically obese, but, but uh, uh, in, in a, you know, overweight. Uh, so, and you see it, you see it. You know, and, it, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's so worrying. And, and you speak to clinicians, they're not worried about you know, tuberculosis, they're worried about what's gonna happen to this person through their lives, because the cost to the health system of this process is so, so high. I believe that we actually need to now roll back a bit on globalization and consolidation, because you're not gonna get diversity unless you do that, okay? There are economic arguments for globalization and consolidation, leave it to the economists to do that. But you know, from perspective of health, biodiversity, climate, we've gotta reverse this, or at least you know, find alternative ways of managing it. And I think we need to reintegrate livestock into more diverse agroecological production systems, okay? So I think pastoralism, Africans, you know, history of pastoralism, it, it should carry on. So my background, you can see my background is East African. Um, and I think it's a fantastic system. It doesn't produce a lot per animal, but it does it sustainably. And it does it across landscapes that otherwise they're not for crop agriculture. And, and they, you know, they provide a degree of health, a high degree of health in those populations. Um, and I think we need regenerative systems in principle, okay, so, um, and, and obviously diversity again. So what, what, what supports those arguments um, um, in terms of reducing? So in Western U Europe, we're already going through this transition um, to a high plant, a low meat based diet. It's happening. Uh, too slowly, probably, but it's happening. So, so I see that is, is on its way now. Unfortunately, the East Asian nations uh, are still going to a higher meat consumption. All right? So that's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a problem. How, how do we actually, you know, or how do they decide maybe this isn't the best way to go? Um, if they reduce their emphasis on chickens, that might help. Okay, it might help quite dramatically. Um, but um, because I think one of the great things about East Asia is their diversity of food. If you go to Vietnam, you have eels for breakfast and you have, you know, something completely different, a raccoon. Or a, you have, I mean, the diversity is fantastic and the food is fantastic. 
Okay? And I see that as a positive thing, but my conservation colleagues say, oh, you know, why are they, you know, all the eels are going to be destroyed? Mate, well, yes, we're not good at doing things sustainably, but the principle of diversity is there. Um, South Asia is already pretty much vegetarian, which is, which is great. Although they have enormous amounts of livestock in uh, India, for example, um, you know, they're, they're actually essentially vegetarians. Um, and of course, it's, it's mixed in Africa. Um, I, and I think that's where meat should be produced, actually. I think if they could become the primary producer for um, ruminant meat in the world, this would be great. It would be much more sustainable than what we're doing you know, in a competitive way against Africa in Europe, consuming huge amounts of energy and resources in, in a place which is not suited, actually, to ruminants at all, um, in a place like Great Britain. Yeah, consumption patterns are key. Um, so, you know, obviously trying to change consumption patterns is, is part of the story, and that will help in terms of general health. Um, yeah, and reducing waste. All these things are policies that we need to go forward um, and, and ensuring fairer distribution and cost. If you look at Europe, 40% of food imported, okay? 56% of the land required for food in Europe is somewhere else. This is wrong. Because we can compete and buy the food, local people can't, can't afford it. This has got to change. This is an important political issue. Um, and then, of course, we have the big waste problem we've talked about. South Africa. Ooh, I've got to be careful what I say here. Okay. <laughs> this could get me out of the room. Um, <clears throat> anyway, South Africa has, you know, has the highest meat consumption in Africa. Um, but there are several interrelated food system challenges. I had a PhD student uh, co-supervised who was working in the chicken, sorry, <laughs> in the chicken industry um, in, in South Africa. So um, anyway, so his conclusions from his PhD, well, I think were very valid. Um, there's, there's marked socioeconomic disparity in access to meat, uh, triple burden of malnutrition, foodborne diseases, uh, and of course, you know, increasing threats to climate change from the food production system in South Africa. And, and, and the key area for expansion is broiler production, okay? Uh, but it lacks policy coherence. So I think we need, to, we need to get that, and that's, I'm challenging you. I think you need to look at that. Um, and there's systemic inequality uh, you know, uh, in, in a whole range of areas, and, and the food safety issues. We heard about the avian influenza in, in, um, you know, in the ostriches. Um, and uh, the environmental sustainability of these systems, I think, is in question. Um, and overall in Africa, has agri-intensification done any good? Actually, that's a big question. And it goes back to quite a long time ago when maize was first brought into the continent. Um, and most reviews uh, that I've looked at, um, that we really haven't done much to reduce stunting rates, for example. Um, and you know, no, none of our developments has really fundamentally changed that, if you're, that lower proportion of people who are suffering from some form of malnutrition or otherwise. So uh, yeah, hunger maybe uh, we've dealt with, but we haven't dealt with a lot of the other issues. Um, yeah, so we've provided calories through, uh, through, this, um, you know, through this production system, but not, not other essential nutrients, etc. cetera, okay? So yeah, I think we have to be very careful uh, where we're going. Good, all right. So do we return to a wild animal and plant harvesting process back to the Holocene? Um, but of course we have biodiversity benefits from consumptive and unconsumptive utilization as land is conserved in the natural state. South Africans have suffered greatly from the criticisms from other countries saying, you kill your elephants, you kill your, your animals, you shoot your animals, you invite the Americans in to do this. You get a lot of criticism. You know, they all hate you, but you're right. You are absolutely right. You know, but it's somehow you haven't communicated it well enough. That's all, all right? If people could understand, actually, that this process, not of farming wildlife, but of utilizing it in a way, um, you benefit wildlife and you benefit the environment they're in. You reduce the dependency on intensified domestic animals. Um, and I think this should be an Africa-wide policy. I really do. Um, and you'll see major, major improvements. Okay, another argument around sustainable, efficient, diverse, nutri nutritious, regenerative agriculture uh, through a crop system. There's no question about this. We've been, always been very clever with uh, crops, uh, you know, whether it be in terrace systems in Southeast Asia. And, and the environment is shaped by 
and, and, and shapes politics, economy, and society. So, you know, it's so, it's so much part of who we are and what we do. And, and, you know, drought is a climatic event, but famine and mass starvation are social ones, okay? So it's how we manage these things in the end which, which really uh, matter. Um, what we do have to understand, though, that intensive livestock production and crop agriculture are very closely linked, okay? We use, we, I heard the statement about um, it's more efficient to have chickens, but you forget the land that you have to use to produce the crops to feed those animals, okay? And that is a major factor, you know, in the um, animal-based food systems. Um, what drives this is free market economics, okay? It's uh, production efficiencies, et cetera, are what drive the whole thing. Resilience, sustainability, health, nutrition, environment do not, but they need to, okay? So that needs to be brought into the accounting. Um, we need to feed the world, yes, but we need to do it without destroying the world. And that's, uh, I think, we all agree with. And we need more farmer-centric policies. The majority of the food systems is controlled by corporations, companies who sit, are divorced from the realities on the ground, and they, but they know how to make a profit. Okay? And we do need money. So I'm not saying that they're entirely wrong. But, but we need to influence their decision-making much more from the perspectives that I'm raising here. And, of course, governments favor agribusiness. Because you know, they get taxes, they get you know, a lot of benefits from this. So anyway, um, but I do believe sustainable intensification um, has a role with crops. Okay? So I do think the science needs to keep working on that because we use so much of the planet for crops. And, and if we reduce animal food, we will continue to use that, but we will save a lot of land through reducing animal uh, products, but we will still have to use a lot of, and so if we can reduce even a proportion of that, we will we'll reach our sort of targets. So fix the system, Mr. Secretary General, okay? Let's fix the system. Um, I think part of that is giving responsibility back to farmers. Look how many small farmers have gone, all right? Traditional farmers have gone. It's consolidation, companies, business. It loses the spirit it loses the heart. It loses the relationship between the human being and the animal. Many countries get it, actually, and they're beginning to talk about uh, sovereignty of land. Um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, it, it's, a way, it's a way we can go, and it, it can help to, I mean, we lose some production, uh, but we also lose waste. So the thing can, can balance. Um, and we lose low input costs. We then, so that, you know, it's, it's like that model I showed you. There are ways of looking at these things, but you have to look at the whole thing, not just one component. Yeah, and I, you know, there's plenty of stats to show how important food is in public health. Okay, massive impacts on public health if you get your food system right. All right, massive. Are there alternatives to the supermarket? Probably not, <laughs> but, but, you know, but we can feed into those markets. I, I've just been in Belgium. You go into a supermarket, and it's like going into a farmer's market, actually. They're sort of breaking it up. It's the fragmenting. The butcher now, you know, used to be in a building in a French village. He now has a place in the supermarket. They're retaining this cultural identity of the, of the butcher. So, yeah, so there are efficiencies you can still gain without losing diversity. But you know, the important thing is not to have food on your shelves that comes from a high ultra-processed factory down the road. That's all. So it's just a change in, in how we manage our food. And 70% and of food is still produced, actually, globally, uh, by uh, small farmers. Uh, another argument, reverse consolidation, reintegrate livestock. Now, from a biodiversity perspective, uh, analysis of that has shown um, that biodiversity is not impacted by non-intensive uh, livestock. It is by crop, you know, crop agriculture uh, and uh, based uh, livestock systems. Okay, so we already know that. We, we know that it's compatible, very compatible. So we have a biodiversity gain. It has very low impacts on, on climate. So it's another big gain. So, you know, pastoral systems, traditional systems are things that I think we need to look at. So I think promote traditional um, rangeland. So these are the sort of, uh, you know, low carbon footprint. You know, we talk about carbon, okay? It's uh, from the climate change, we have to think that way. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that. So I'm just thinking on time, how much have I got? Another seven, 10 minutes? Yeah, who's keeping the clock? 
minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah? Okay. You sh you're happy? All right. A colleague of mine, Serge Miranda, many of you may know him. Um, he's he's a, a, a French scientist who's worked mostly in the, in the Far East, but uh, he's very good. He's a good modeler. And, uh, and we, you know, over the zoonosis issue, I've been working a little bit with him. And, and uh, so this was a product of looking at zoonotic diseases, vector-borne diseases between 1990 and 2020, and, and trying to look at, um, you know, associations. You know, it's a it's a bit like some of the earlier talks, you know, we try and like the, the ostriches, was it, you know, was it the wild birds, was it this, you know, so we, we, we develop these models and we pull in data and we, we work with these things. Um, and uh, so here we are trying to get to the root of, well, what was the primary drivers between, behind these zoonotic events? So the outcome of this is you can then break it down and into the, uh, using structural equation modeling. And, and the red lines there are where you get a positive association. So when we look at zoonosis, not surprisingly, there's a positive association between uh, livestock and zoonosis. You know, it's, it's sort of common sense, but, but you, have to, you have to do it, you have to see it. But there isn't a, a common association between wildlife or grasslands or, you know, in other words, or crop agriculture, okay? So in other words, you can begin to tease out, if you're thinking of zoonotic risks or zoonosis type risks, of what really matters. Yes, animals are a very big part of it, and domestic animals are a very big part of it, but um, maybe crop agriculture isn't, okay? And so that we can then say that. Um, and you can sort of throw these things around and, and, and uh, you know, strengthen your understanding of where the mo major risks are coming from in relation to, uh, to infectious disease. Uh, and I think that's really important. Okay, so just in summary from that, so agricultural expansion is seen as a driver of biodiversity loss. We, we accept that. Uh, and potentially emerging infectious diseases. Uh, we show that cropland and grassland expansion does not, okay? So going back to this idea of pastoralism, if we increase grasslands, it's not going to affect disease emergence very much. And that's sort of counterintuitive to some people because they say, oh, the pastoralists, they're full of disease. Yes, but rather like wildlife, it's sort of in balance you know, if I go and look at FMD in a cow in Kenya, and Gavin Thompson and I went in the field when Gavin first joined me at the African Union, many of you know Gavin, and he came from South Africa with, uh, and from the FMD Commission with a very clear feeling about FMD. By the time he left Kenya five years later, and some of you know the story, he had been chucked out of the Commission and he was advocating commodity-based trade and the pulling of fences down. Okay? It's from going out there amongst people seeing what FMD was doing in the local traditional cattle population, and they're always saying is, why didn't you speak to us before? This is not a problem, <laughs> okay? Why are you telling me it's a problem? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not. Yes, if you introduce intensified livestock systems like dairy, you begin to get a problem for the reasons I've explained earlier. You bring animals that are highly vulnerable to these things, but indigenous livestock has evolved, like wildlife has evolved, and it's resilient. Okay, so these are important studies, I think. Uh, using natural resources. Okay, I, uh, bushmeat's been part of, uh, still is, extremely important resource uh, in many countries. Um, and there are some species that are very fecund, very, you know, a cane rat, you know, in, in West Africa. These things reproduce so quickly. You can't crop them quickly enough. And, and I'm happy to say they keep cropping them. And, uh, and they like them. But people look at it and say, this is terrible. But, but is it? Or is it actually, you know, I mean, if we don't have those cane rats, the forest is gone. And I can see it happening um, in my work. Yeah, so I think there's strong arguments for artisanal fishing, artisanal processes, harvesting systems. Um, and I think Africa in particular, because you have a lot of pathogens here. So the more you try and, and grow livestock, I see pigs in Uganda. Or you don't see the pigs because they've died from African swine fever. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, and right now, of course, we export Af African swine fever, which is uh, really sad. Well, maybe it's a good thing, actually. Get your own back. <laughs> All right. What we must do is stop and reverse deforestation. I, I showed you the depressing picture that afforestation ha will have no effect on, on climate change. It won't. No effect at all. But deforestation, if we can reverse it and stop it, of course, is part of the process. It's helping biodiversity, it's helping uh, climate change. Uh, land soil degradation, which is a product of intensification, remains. Biodiversity loss, and we must stop climate change. We mu if we don't do it, it is curtains, ladies and gentlemen. It is curtains. 
Uh, so we need to promote good practices. You know, we, we call it conservation, we call it organic, we call it regenerative, uh, whatever you, name you'd like to call it. It's just good practice, actually. And your grandfathers, my grandfather, my grandmother, probably my grandmother, actually, um, they understood this much more. Um, and uh, we need to get back to thinking that way, I think. All right, cheap food is driving a problem. Um, it's not hunger, actually. Uh, it's the global commoditization of food and markets and so on, which is really behind a lot of these problems. Um, modern industrial agriculture, I don't think it's sustainable, uh, you know, or desirable, actually. Uh, but some intensification and use of science in agriculture and in production system remains, I think, a, 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 a very important. So it's just a slight change in mindset. Um, and we've got too many pathogens spilling over now, all right, because we've created systems that generate and create, and the consequences that we know from COVID are not sustainable. And that was a mild virus, okay? That was a really mild, I've had it twice. Actually, I just had it a month ago uh, from going to the United States, uh, and I had got quite sick. So, you know, despite three vaccines, four vaccines, whatever. So, you know, the thing is, these, these are important questions now that we need to address. Um, yeah, and the externalities of the food system are really where we have to address our things. I think we have to halt agricultural expansion, so we need to just intensify and manage within the system that is appropriate. Um, and I think in uh, suitable lands, like pastoral lands, we can, you know, expand, uh, help them, help them to improve their system, actually. Um, there's a lot uh, of, of yield gaps within pastoral systems which could be addressed. Um, hey, yeah, leave room for old, new. And I think harvesting should, should still be on the table. Uh, commoditization, um, uh, you know, we've sort of lost our sense of the spirit that I said to you at the beginning. We've lost the spirit of who we are and what we're part of as humans. And I think we need to capture that. We need to recapture. And there are indigenous people out there who have been saying this for, for decades, you know, that you've lost your way, folks. And you need to come back. You need to talk to your, you know, to, to your wise people in your society to try and find a way back. And you know, it's not all bad news. Human population is stabilizing. We have, you know, in Britain now, uh, if we go on at the rate we're, we're at, in three generations, there'll be, we'll be 25% of the population now. In three, that's not long, okay? But migration, thankfully, will keep our economy going. <laughs> but there we go. <laughs> All right. Anyway, many acknowledge acknowledgements uh, <clears throat> to colleagues. I, you know, I speak. I speak. Uh, I, I, I'm a. I guess I'm a truth giver. I'm giving the truth as I see it from others and uh, you know from my own experiences. Um, you take it. You think about it. You do what you want. Professor Rabani, thank you so much. Really wonderful to to come and be with you. You're a great and important community. Thank you.